So uh, let me see if you see my slides. Yep, perfect. Great, and then that's okay, good. Okay, again, thank you for the opportunity to present this one. This is really close to my heart. Uh, I want to discuss how we can do some quantitative work with on the idea of race, marginalization, underserved communities. And to do that, I prefer to give you very good and exciting example. So you will be seeing like 20, 30 people, like uh, their pictures and some examples of their work and some very famous studies in the field. No conflict of interest, starting with theory. As you know, to build your study, you need a theory. One of the maybe most commonly used theories for health disparity work and working with the underserved population is fundamental cause theory by these two beautiful pictures, husband and wife, Bruce Link and Joe Fallon, uh, both at Columbia and also UC Riverside. So if you have a question, you need just uh, one hour to drive to get to them. So what type of work they have done? They have discussed that social determinants and socioeconomic status and social conditions work as causes of causes. So the reason underserved population is not doing as good as the other group related to health is because the most distal social determinants are being like the policies for them and opportunities and are different in the life of uh, minorities and marginalized groups. One of the papers they have done, they have write it for racism as a funda fundamental cause of health. So if you want to build, you want to work on theory and you want to work on racism, you have the chance to do fundamental cause and bring their work on racism, not race, as a fundamental cause of health inequality. Then you have Sir Michael Marmot, at, in UK, who is one of the physicians who, like those physicians who never practiced, um, he pu published Marmot Review 10 years ago. And then 10 years later, we have the Marmot Review 10 years on as a revision of the document. Previously, it was advocating, the work was advocating for universal solutions was saying that if you want to improve the health of the underserved, you need to bring everyone up. But during these 10 years and also the other people's work showed that bringing everyone up would increase the inequality. So one proposal was targeted solutions. However, in their review, in their second review, they showed that even targeted uh, interventions do not solve the problem of barriers and many underserved people do not pay uptake the intervention. So they suggested that we should do proportionate universality, that we should do universal intervention, but the dosage of the intervention would be different and would be proportionate to the need of the population, underserved population would get the largest uh, proportion of the intervention. You can also build your work in the theoretical framework on the work of John Mirovsky and Catherine Ross, who published a lot of uh, theoretical papers around like 40 years ago and they did these three things. One, 
they showed that the effect of education and income are different. Income reduces stress and enhances your access to power and healthy social network and better life conditions. And education not only enhances income, but also uh, improves health behaviors. So they said it, it is not just social economic status, the mechanism of the effect of education and income are totally different. One is more behavioral and one is more related to life conditions. And also they differentiated between gradient effect of education. This is a typo. It's gradient and threshold effect of in education, not income. The gradient effect of uh, education means each year of schooling that you spend more in your life would predict your health. And threshold effect is the credentials effect. You get a degree and you get a better job or you, you can afford living in a better environment. So they decompose even within education, the effect of the gradient effect, years of schooling, linear effect and traditional threshold effect, the categorical effect. So th then this line of work suggests that if you are looking at the socioeconomic determinants of depression and you are saying that a stress predicts depression, it is better to have income, not education. And if you are looking at socioeconomic determinants of smoking, it's not the effect of income, mainly it is effect of your cognitive capacity and the way you see the world. So it is education, not income. So the outcome determines which type of social determinants you need to have in your research. That is the work by Mirovsky and Ross. And you can also build your research, the theoretical part of it on Weathering hypotheses are Lynn Geronimus' work from my the department that I was there in a School of Public Health, University of Michigan Health Behavior and Health Education. The start or the early work of Arlene was a very uh, one that generated a lot of debate, and that was this differential pattern of association between age and birth outcomes in white and black communities. She thought, she, she uh, in, in fact got a lot of negative feedback from researchers, scholars, policymakers. She showed that for white people, the likelihood of poor birth outcome increases in a later stage of life. But for black women, if they pass like age 30 or 25, they have very high, higher chance of poor birth outcome. And she said, this might be a reason as an adaptation, this part of the research was troubling, that maybe as an adaptation, because of their conditions, black women have decided to bring the childbearing ages faster or earlier so they can avoid poor outcomes of birth. But then years later, she, many people started quoting and citing Arlene Ger Geronimo's work which was built on this work and saying that the cumulative effect of a stress increases your allostatic load, which is not just one marker inflammatory or biological marker, it is a combination of multiple uh, markers and that also works through epigenetics. Or in theory wise, you can build your work on the work of Kimberly Kreshner, uh, and also a colleague of her, Vicky Mays, 
at UCLA and Columbia who did the intersectionality. So the experiences, life experiences of the subgroups of the society are unique to those groups. So group membership comes with a set of unique set of exposures, resilience and vulnerabilities. And one, what uh, relates to one group may be totally irrelevant to another group. So in some way, when I look at the intersection of socioeconomic status and race, and sometimes I do gender, I am using some sort of intersectionality. Or you can build your theory based on family stress model. The big name behind this model is Wani McLeod, also at UVM, University of Michigan. McLeod conducted the study and showed that development of kids in black families is under influence of parenting of those black parents, but the way they do parenting is highly influenced by socioeconomic, especially economic pressures. This, the same idea, they need to do more investment on the work side, they bring, they become tired, they have fatigue, and then they may not allocate the same resources that a, a white parent allocates because of the economic pressures. So work demands, parental investment, social mobility prospects, economic hardship. So the model here is social structure, uh, economic opportunities, uh, workload and work demand, parenting, and then under or less than expected outcomes in the youth in black families. Or you may want to work on the idea of how a, a, poor, a person who is born to the poor family can come up to the middle class by these three steps, as Ron Haskins at Brookings says, that get an education, get an employment, and avoid early pregnancy. And this is the type of work, this is the same level of work that Raj Chetty as, at Harvard is following. Raj Chetty at Harvard is asking who gets a higher chance of upward social mobility defining by employment or education across race by education and gender groups. And he has shown a paper that two years ago was everywhere from New York Times to Washington Post, everywhere was saying that it's not a matter of race, it is a matter of the intersection of race and gender because racism in the United States has been extremely sexualized or gendered. Black men in the US have the lowest chance of upward educational and economic mobility different than uh, black women. Okay, so those were a few theoretical framework. But what do you do in a statistical way? So what do you do with your data? As I said, like two hours ago, the common approach to health inequality and explaining that why underserved population do worse regarding health is a mediational model that most people have suggested that like race is correlated with health either because it is associated with the lower or higher socioeconomic status, different place, another level of stress or discrimination. So you see that stress is general stress. So you see, this is a mediational model of health inequality. Another name for this is differential exposure. So you argue that the reason one group does worse 
is because they get more of the bad risk factor or the less they get less of the protective factor. However, there are there is some evidence suggesting that groups do not have the same chance of translating their resource to an outcome. One group of people say, if you are a minority group or marginalized group, the SES would generate more health, as I said, like Deborah King. And I am saying your resource generates less health in under racism if you are non-white, because of social structure and uh, structural racism. So you see both of the, these competing hypotheses both suggest that there is a moderation in a statistical term, but the direction of the moderation is totally opposite. One uh, being Deborah King's work saying that disadvantage or minority status increases your susceptibility. And I'm saying it reduces the effects. You heard about this uh, two hours ago, I'm passing. Let's talk about some people who are doing very interesting research in this area. James Heckman, Chicago. He's the mind behind the idea that pr probably the most effective intervention to eliminate inequalities, including health inequality, is early child education. So if you can help black families put their kid in a head start or after a school program or before a, before a school program, why they cannot do it? In a, again, in a population, of course, many of them can do it, but in a population level, because they are struggling fighting for jobs, more jobs in a segregated area. So they are not as proximal to jobs compared to their white competing job applicants. So they need to spend more time to get to the job. So what is the consequence? Their kids have a lower chance of getting to a, um, before a school, for example, or they may need to pay for it so they don't have the same chance. So he won the Nobel Prize in economics for multiple contributions, including one of them being early intervention at the level of education is the solution. This was the common belief and is still common belief that can undo inequalities by that type of, that timing of intervention. But one to two years ago, a more detailed analysis of early childhood educational interventions by Greg Duncan at UCI here, University of California, Irvine, showed that the inequalities tend to persist. And it has been an over, uh, not over reporting, but we have overestimated. We have been overestimating the effect of early childhood interventions on late outcomes. They showed some diminished returns of early childhood interventions. Why? Because under racism, if you can give them good education, they are, they are not going to change their names and the black name on a job application gets different rate of callbacks than a white name. So of course it cannot fully undo racism. So Greg Duncan showed that yes, it is a great intervention to do early childhood education intervention, but we have been uh, overestimating its effect. Here are two people who do another type of work with health inequality. One is Tom Levis, Dean of uh, 
Tulane University School of Public Health. And he's like a big name. And he's one of the figures, main figures who has shown that a big part of health inequalities can be explained by place. So the argument like the short version is, is it race or place? And he says it is mainly, not fully, mainly place. So if we can fully uh, eliminate segregation, then you would be able to really minimize inequalities that I, I don't think so. I will explain why. It, even he has published some evidence suggesting that it will only reduce 30% to 40% of the uh, inequalities. But so who does race or place? One of the big names, Tom Levis. Another type of very interesting work by Tom Levis is he's the person who showed Minority people or, or any specific racial group report the highest level of medical and healthcare satisfaction if the provider is from the same race. So he published this uh, very important paper that if you increase diversity of the healthcare force, at least you can increase satisfaction of non-white population. There are some few, a few papers later showing that, the, but the outcomes are not following the same way. So if a black patient has a black doctor, the outcome is not necessarily the same level of gain that subjective satisfaction is improving, but there is a debate on that objective part of it, but at least at the subjective level, concordance of race increases satisfaction of non-white patient. Then uh, one of uh, Tom Levy's mentees, Ronald Trope, who is now a uh, health disparity chair at Johns Hopkins. So he is running a men's health inequality center, has worked with Tom Levis on a very interesting study, which is they have looked at the integrated communities. And by the way they have defined integration is they have said the uh, white and black people in that area should have the same income. So if you find a zip code that average income of black and white people in that zip code is exactly the same, then we call that area integrated community. So that their study is exploring health disparities in integrated communities or ethnic. And then they compared, this is an NIH funded study, they compared it with enhanced data. And they showed that around 30% of the odds ratio of, for, for some of the outcomes, it was fully explaining. So there was no black white difference in those areas for some outcomes. And for some other outcomes, it's a 30% reduction in the effect size for race. So we can say around 30% to 40% of the differences by race, is explained by uh, place. However, they have only looked at the poor areas. They, they have said it because most of the areas that white people and black people are making the same money is not, it's not Beverly Hills. If you go to Beverly Hills and at Beverly Hills, white wealthy people are making a lot more money than black wealthy people. But when, if you go to poor areas, you would see some equally poor white and black people. So their research doesn't look at the integrated white communities, they look at integrated poor communities. And that is just half of the picture. And, uh, Researcher at UCSF, 
another big big name Paula Braveman has worked and shown that social determinants of health do not fit all the same way. So when you talk about income in a black community and you talk about income in a white community, they are totally qualitatively different. So, and then the statistical conclusion behind this observation is do not use principal component analysis for socioeconomic status and use them across races. So in, in, in some way, all of my work is about the same pattern of observation, that social determinants of health are not comparable across groups. So Paula Braveman, when it comes to SES, socioeconomic status, one size does not fit all. Another person who is the friend and mentor and who doing great job in Michigan is Lou Penner. Lou Penner does two types of very interesting work. One is they use implicit, they measure implicit bias. So they use implicit, uh, implicit association test, which was designed by Harvard. And they give it to whom? to patient and also doctor. And on the, it, it, this is very interesting. On paper, doctors are much less racist than non-doctors on paper. So if you give a racism measure, like, do you, are you okay if a non-white person comes and next, leave uh, next door, door to you and all those? There is a huge difference in response of black and white people. However, if you measure implicit bias, there is not much difference in the implicit bias of doctors and just the lay person. So that is observation number one. The second observation is that this implicit bias determines the satisfaction of the physician. So if I, patients, in when a patient is receiving care from hands of a doctor with high implicit bias, when they leave that office, they say less satisfied. And then if you measure that in two months, the adherence to medication is very much lower than a patient who received the same care from a doctor who, who is low in implicit bias. And when that person comes from the office door out, says high satisfaction, and two months later, high adherence to medication, and then the outcomes. So this is very, very interesting li line of work by Lou Penner. Then the same social psychology type of work is by is being done by Alison Earl, and I want to give you one of the examples of amazing work that she is doing. She's also in Michigan Department of Psychology. It has been this is like one or two minutes summary. It has been a belief that if you tailor health communication messages, the person is going to uptake it more and change their behavior more in response. Dr. Earl has shown that that is only true when the message is not related causing a stigma and fear. That means if you are working on HIV risk reduction and if you give a pamphlet with a black face on it to a black person, the person is not going to read that pamphlet because you are using a stigma related message and mapping it to the racial identity of the individual. So it is shocking because if you ask many people that what is the best solution to increase uh, adherence to these messages, many people would say tailoring, but her work shows tailoring works 
but in certain conditions, then you are not stigmatizing the group. If you do the same thing on flu or flu shot, if the pamphlet has a black face on it, they are going to adhere more. But if it is about HIV, they, they associate it to racism and discrimination. So another type of work that in this area of inequalities, financial problems are done, I want to give you one very cool example by Arlene Geronimus. Arlene showed that in Detroit, overall, if you are living a financially difficult life, you have a shortened telomere. So the part of the gene that highly correlates with your age and highly correlates with the time that you die. So it is like a biological clock part of the DNA, that is under influence of financial stress overall in Detroit. However, if you look at, at Black people, there is no association between financial hardship of, and telomere length of Black people. And if you look at Latino people, you see the reverse. So, Telomere has not is not showing a shortened pattern under financial stress in Latino community. So the the what we learn from the books about the financial effect of financial stress on health does not necessarily universally fit every group. This is very good work by Arlene Geronimus. Then there are also other group who do race by gender, by age, intersection on the effect of social determinants of health. And here are the, the most powerful group of researchers, Mark Highward, Jennifer Montes, and Robert Hammer. And they are doing, Probably they have published 20, 30 papers, high impact papers, showing that the gradient effect and the threshold effect of education on mortality is specific to the intersection of your race and your gender and your age. Here is one example. They looked at the national data from 1986 to 2006 to see how groups differ in the effect of education by time. So the protective effect of education by time. They showed that the gradient effect became stronger in older ages for white and black men. So if you are born now and if you are white male, your education really matters. That is the same for black males. However, for white and black women, mortality risk decreased among the college education, but increased among those. That means if you are a female in the United States, the threshold effect of education is becoming stronger. If you are a male in the United States, the gradient effect of education is becoming stronger for you. That is totally different universes. We also have, uh, here is also a, some sort of friend, Tom fuller Robel, who has shown two very interesting findings. One, so I don't know how, how many minutes, Five minutes. Oh, sorry, doctor. Sorry. So you mm -hmm. have until 2 30. 2 30. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Good. You have nine more minutes. Okay. So if you look at the, he has shown that first for high SES white people, for white people, SES reduces, high SES reduces uh, discrimination. What, what does that mean? That means in the white community, 
Who gets discriminated? The poor person gets discriminated. But many studies, including his work, also shows that it is reversed in the black community. In black community, who gets more discriminated? The wealthy, high SES person. The second part of the very interesting work he has done is he has shown a positive association between educational performance and health in schools, at the schools. And there either no association or reverse association at the schools for black people, black kids. So if you are a white kid, you are doing great at the school. Your health is better than a white kid who is doing worse educationally. But if you are black kid at a school and doing great, your health is worse than your black peer who does. So, and this talks about discrimination at the school level, uh, fight of the high SES black families who are going through and many other mechanisms. I don't have a lot of time, but Ryan Cobb, another uh, colleague is doing great work showing that differential association of discrimination on inflammation, Daryl Hudson has published uh, on high SES black families challenges and why they become depressed. So Daryl is doing that type of work. Corey KS at Emory has published on the resilience of uh, disadvantaged black families. James Jackson has shown that in, under marginalization, you may engage in certain type of risk behaviors to regulate your HPA access. So the mechanism or the biological mechanism that respond to a stress is being shaped by the risk behaviors that you take. And this is why he argued that you would maintain your mental health with the cost of poor physical health. Uh, Brianna Mezuk is following the same work, calling it environmental affordances model. And Don Muzen at Rutgers trying to explain what explains, try to understand what explains paradox of mental health in black communities. Why we see lower than expected prevalence of depression in black community. Neil Krauss has shown that same level of social support and uh, religiosity has a stronger effect on the well being and health of black compared to white people. Carol Graham has used Gallup poll data to show that if you ask people, what is your level of satisfaction? Many black people in the United States say, I am some sort of satisfied because I am doing better than my previous generation in a well-being type of question, not physical health. But if you ask white people under poverty, many, as, many white people under poverty, they will say, I'm doing worse than my previous generation. And you, the reason you see economic stress differently influencing groups is because the reference group for comparing what should be their expectations is different across racial groups. So I have a lot of additional things. So I probably I need to give uh, some time for uh, question, right, Christina, or I can continue. Oh, sorry, I muted myself. Um, let me see. So we're at 226. If I haven't seen any questions in the chat, so I feel like if anyone has any burning questions, feel free to speak up or to um, write it in the chat. But I think if not, I think you can continue to use your full time. Good. Christina, don't, don't we have a time for discussion? Oh, good question. No, not no. We did our discussion this morning. We built our next discussion uh, for the next um, institute in the afternoon. Okay. But we already did our discussion this morning. Yeah. Yeah. yeah why, why don't we leave time for some of the questions and maybe some of the students can um, give yeah. their thoughts or ask? Yes. 
Yeah, question. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Um, wow, thank you. I always learn so much from, um, from you, Dr. Sorry. Um, my question, Shervin, is these models, they all seem to assume that the curriculum being taught is not racist, is not sexist, is not contributing to like what you might call like an assimilation effect, right? And we know that a lot of scholars in education, like in curriculum studies, um, talk about this, like about the psychologically violent um, a violence and trauma that the very Eurocentric post enslavement a Thanksgiving, et cetera, type stuff is taught. So with that background, the first question is, um, why isn't it considered? And second, what would a piece of research look like to call scholars to collect this kind of data at the population level to test these burning and very pertinent question because oh, oh, it seems like as soon as we get through all of these hoops that these like a scholars present, there's it's still not going to account for the variance of a racist curriculum, even up through medical school, right, etc. Correct. Thank you very much, Colin. So, very good point. So there has been a campus which has suggested that education is not just lower quality, the curriculum is designed for a European mental model. So it is not, so it is a structurally discriminating one group. So that you are asking a policy question that uh, at the state or uh, school district, which schools have been able to modify some of their curriculum to some degree? And what is the effect of that modification? You know, I was at, uh, in Michigan before I come to California. Now I, I totally see the difference in the curriculum of my kid. I have a 10 year old and my 10 year old is hearing a lot about LGBT in a not near like, not discriminatory way. And there was nothing like this in Michigan. So that means if you compare, and, and we were in Ann Arbor, in one of the like most liberal areas in Michigan, the curriculum was not as uh, the, the same way you wanted it to be compared to California. So the question is what data set we can get to look at the intersectional effect of all these policies and individual level, because a lot of these effects are transferred by the teachers and teachers experiences and teachers uh, discrimination and all those. So I'm also guilty. So I, when I wanna study school quality, I look at the number of uh, free lunches and free breakfast and I count it as uh, like uh, proxy as quality or something, but you are right. It's much more about quality and curriculum that should be ex explained. Thank you so much. I was very, very curious. I pre totally appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. Okay, thank you, Dr. Asari, very interesting. Let's go to Dr. Aravian. Okay, thank you very much. Please just stop sharing your document. And uh, Dr. Booker Vaughn is gonna give the introduction. Um, hello, 
Um, Christina, what I um, I have is just the name. I didn't have any of the bio behind, um, like the. Aravin? Aravin? Christina, unmute yourself and kindly uh, give us. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry about that. No I was problem. speaking. You want to give I the introduction? Christina? I didn't realize. Is he on? Dr. Arifian, are you on? Oh. Here and she did not respond to my email for her bio. I mean, for her presentation either. Yeah, so, so he confirmed that he was going to present, but you're right, I didn't get his presentation either. So I'm not sure if he's, I can send him an email. Um, does anyone happen to have a cell phone number? I'll send him another message. And then if not, maybe we can just continue with Dr. Sari's presentation. If Dr. Sari, you're available. I am available and half of my slides are left, so I... Oh, perfect, wonderful. So then it might just work out nicely. Um, here, I'm gonna stop.